it's actually kind of amazing how many wires got crossed on this project. But we are finally doing it. We are building petabyte project number two, and not a moment too soon. We may not even have enough space left on our servers to offload the footage that we are recording right now. And Linus, you might say, you could just stop being such a digital hoarder and, oh, I don't know, delete some bloody data. But I actually have the perfect counter argument to that. <clears throat> you sound like my wife. Just let me have my fun. And we're gonna have some fun today, ladies and gentlemen, because um, I accidentally have over three petabytes of hard drives. Smart Deploy makes it easy to handle daily IT tasks like Windows imaging, patching, updating apps, and migrating user data. You can do it all over your existing network or the cloud without leaving your desk. Get your free offer at smartdeploy.com slash Linus. All right, so the first problem was entirely my fault, actually. I told Seagate that our goal was to show off one petabyte of usable space in a single 4U enclosure, instead of doing it in two enclosures like we did last time. And I told them that to do that, I would need 75 of their 16 terabyte hard drives to account for the space that we'd lose to formatting overhead and parity data. So that's true. In five ZFS RAID Z2 arrays, we would be able to lose ugh, up to two drives per VDEV. So that's up to a maximum of 10 of our 75 drives before we would actually lose any data. And that would still yield over 950 terabytes of accessible space. One small problem though. The uh, custom 75 drive chassis that I thought I asked 45 drives for, they were like, yeah, yeah there, bud. Your server's in the mail, bud. You're welcome, bud. They're Eastern Canadian. They really do sound like that. It's amazing. And I was like, so is it the 75 drive custom one? And they're like, what are you talking about there, bud? I apparently never clarified I needed 75 bays. So it has 60. So it looks like we're gonna have about 750 terabytes of usable space. But hold on, hold on, guys. The title is not clickbait. I am still gonna have one petabyte of raw capacity in here. The difference is that we're gonna make up some of that shortfall with solid state. All right, so let's take a look at the drives that Seagate sent over here. Um, so there's actually more boxes here than I expected, uh, which is interesting. So we're all, we're all learning things today. Um, this can go here. So these are the ones that are right. These, are the ones that we can do first. This is so hilarious. Oh my God, there's so many of them that this is actually like, like this will actually build up pretty high. I'm not quite sure how it happened, but this was error number two. Seagate's Iron Wolf NAS drives are designed for network attached storage use. They're spec for a million hours mean time between failure and 180 terabytes of access per year. They've got a three year warranty and they feature Seagate's Agile Array, a combination of hardware and firmware features that make them perform better in RAID arrays. They've got RV sensors and better vibration tolerance to improve performance and reliability in multi-drive arrays and a combination of solid performance and power consumption across a wide variety of workloads, including video editing, which is our primary concern around here. We actually end up editing video directly off of the vault more often than you'd probably think because whether it's a big project and Monix server has no room or because a sponsor wants a change after the fact or whatever the case may be. So thank you, Seagate. Appreciate you, fam. These are great drives and we've recommended them loads of times except for one small problem. I, I really don't know where the communication wires got crossed, but these are rated for use in enclosures of up to eight drives at a time. Okay then. So Seagate then sent over a few boxes of their Iron Wolf Pro drives, putting us up to a total of over two petabytes of storage but those are also only meant to have up to 24 drives in an enclosure. I mean, honestly speaking, I would have been perfectly comfortable with the Iron Wolf Pros. 
They've got an extra two years of warranty compared to the regular Iron Wolf. They've got included data rescue service, and they've got a greater rating for both their per year use and mean time between failure. But thing is, we're supposed to be setting a good example for you guys. And when I clarified, hey guys, so the plan is actually to put all the drives into one system, they sent over the big dogs. Meet the Exos 16 in its top current capacity of 16 terabytes. Each of these is rated for a massive 550 terabytes per year of access and two and a half million hours mean time between failure with all of the vibration sensing and mitigation technology at Seagate's disposal to rate them then for an unlimited number of drives per enclosure. Oh, you know, let's add them to the pile, right? I have never seen this much storage in one place in my life. This is over three raw petabytes of storage. 225 drives times 16 terabytes each. The bad news is Seagate says that I have to use the earlier shipments of our drives for other stuff or send them back. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss some more NAS building collabs with other YouTubers. That's one of the ideas that I had. Anyway, let's use this opportunity to take a closer look at our enclosure now. I am wicked excited about this server. So this is an early model. This is a prototype of their next generation Storinator. Ah! There we go. Oh, okay. Oh. Now from the outside, this looks like a regular old plain Storinator with 45 drives, typical all sheet metal construction and all that good stuff. But, oh, that's different. They have stepped up their game. So they actually went from a cable-based backplane system where every single port was individually wired in to these PCB backplanes. So this dramatically simplifies the cabling since they're just running one quad port SAS cable for each of the four bays. And it also should theoretically improve reliability. They've also put in some logic to stagger the spin ups of the drive so you don't get that same kind of power surge when you first turn on a Storinator and all up to 60 drives are like, start like ramping up. Very cool. I'm not ready to actually build this thing up yet though because there is another surprise. Now, I don't know how much of this came about because of my request or how much they were working on already. But what's this then? 45 Drives has finally joined Team Red. That's right. So we've got an AMD Epic processor in here. I'm actually not 100% sure exactly what the model number is. And then it's equipped with, what are we looking at here? just shy of 128 gigs of RAM. Now, there was a bit of a mishap on our unit, and this is like an engineering sample board that Gigabyte provided, so I couldn't really get a new one. Two of these memory slots are dead, but this is a hard drive-based storage system, so I'm not actually too worried about the uh, extra couple of channels of memory killing our system performance like it did in our all NVMe NAS. With that said, I did allude to needing some SSDs in order to make up the difference in capacity between the 60 drive one and the 75 drive one that I thought 45 drives was working on. That is where these come in and I need to actually find out what the devil they are. All right, here we go. So there's a feature of ZFS called Adaptive Replacement Cache or ARC. And essentially what it does is it takes the most frequently used data from your hard drives and then stores a second copy on your system memory so that you don't have to go all the way out to your spinning disks in order to access it. And that's especially important for something like running VMs or a database where a lot of the lookups are gonna be to the same few entries. We're already using that on the existing petabyte project, you know, the one with the two bays. What we are not using is something called L2 arc or level two arc. Thing is, Sure, you can add hundreds of gigabytes or even terabytes of memory to a system now, 
but the cost can be quite prohibitive. So that is where SSDs come into play. So this right here is a 7.68 terabyte SSD, so nearly eight terabyte SSD from Micron that's, yeah, it's only SATA six gigabit per second, but even though that's obviously a lot slower than system memory, it's much faster than spinning disks and easily enough to saturate our 10 gigabit or even a 40 gigabit network connection. And then importantly, it is much cheaper than just chucking more RAM into the system. Now, something to bear in mind here is that we ended up putting uh, six of these in here in order to get our raw capacity up to the petabyte that we promised. But L2 Arc actually does not scale especially well with a ton of capacity. So it's possible that what we'll end up doing is only using some of it, cheating a little bit. But for the time being, hey, we got a petabyte of capacity. Also, uh, just like Arc, it only has a copy of the data on it. So it doesn't actually count towards your total capacity. But these are just minor details, like, you know, which way the drive goes in, for example. I know I'm gonna get judged so hard for this, but while I could put a dual 10 gigabit mezzanine card in right here in this open gap in the back, I have actually decided to use one of our ancient ConnectX2 40 gig InfiniBand cards because I had a slot that didn't have a cover on it and I don't know what else to do with this ancient thing anyway. And it's, I mean, it's 40 gig, even though it's an older card, it's plenty for hard drives. <laughs> so that's in there with its 3D printed bracket from that video a long time ago. This is a really nice feature. So I've actually done this the janky way, just like hot gluing or double-sided taping a fan on top of my HBA cards. So these are the controller cards for all these drives we're gonna plug in. But hey, now there's a, you know, an officially sanctioned way to do it. Sweet, so we've got a cooling fan to take care of all of our add-in cards down here. Very nice. Wow, now that they've got so much space here, they could definitely modify the chassis and do a third fan here if they really wanted to. That's freaking awesome. Uh, this is an example of a really old Storinator. This is from about five years ago. You can see there's a lot of, oh, there's a lot of things about it that are a lot worse. So this horrible, horrible mounting system for the drives with like these rods holding the thing down. That wasn't great. You can see there's a lot less space in here. Oh, right. I haven't even talked about the new mounting system for the drives. Okay, we're gonna do that. But first I want you guys to check out, this is how they used to cable it up. What a nightmare. We've actually done a swap for a dead port on one of these things and it was not a lot of fun. This right here is apparently a 3D printed like kind of friction mount. And then that works with the spring mount that they already had on some of the newer chassis, along with that PCB backplane, which apparently makes it easier to align the slots perfectly so that it's easier to put the drives in and out. So let's see if that actually worked out. All right, so in used to be fine anyway, but out, oh, okay. That's not bad. So all that remains now is to install 60 drives. Well, 58, I already did two. You can tell this one is very prototype. It's got lots of scratches and dings and stuff. I believe this really was their working sample of it before they sent it over to me. You know, you could call it used or you could call it pre-tested. Home stretch and 900. 60 terabytes of raw spinning storage, along with 46 terabytes of SSD storage for a total of one petabyte in a single chassis. But I'm not quite done yet. Right now, the one thing that's missing here is a slog device. So I already talked about read caching, which doesn't really have any dangers associated with it because you're just making copies of this data to put on your RAM or on your L2 ARC. But write caching, write caching is something you can do with ZFS and you can use your memory for it. But the problem is that in the event of a sudden power loss, which who knows, could happen, any in-flight data that's sitting in RAM but hasn't been committed to your hard drives yet will be lost. 
So it might be worthwhile adding something like an Optane SSD to one of our PCI Express slots over here to handle caching data that is being written so that we won't lose it in the event that it's sitting in RAM limbo and hasn't been committed to persistent storage. All that though is gonna be reserved for part two, where Anthony and I are gonna team up to get this thing up and running on the network so we can start offloading some of the data from the original vault to the new consolidated vault. Yes, my friends, the capacity of two vaults is now one vault. Isn't technology amazing? Speaking of amazing technology, Pulseway is a real-time remote monitoring and management software that helps you fix problems on the go by sending commands from any mobile device. It's compatible with Windows, Mac, and Linux, and Pulseway's single app gives you remote desktop functionality, you can get real-time status, system resources, logged in users, network performance, you can manage Windows updates, and more. With Pulseway, you can create and deploy custom scripts to automate your IT task, and you can scan, install things, update all your systems on the go. It's super cool and super powerful, and you can try it for free at pulseway.com or through our link in the video description. So thanks for watching, guys. If you're looking for something else to watch, why not check out the epic saga that was our NVMe storage server upgrade? Yeah, we're basically replacing the whole server room right now, if you guys didn't sort of pick up on that.